This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you so much for this very nice introduction, Richard, and thank you for inviting me. I'm actually delighted to be here, to be back here, because the last time I came, neither Victor nor Richard were here. <laughs> um, so uh, it's, a, it's a special pleasure. Um, and indeed, this is a project that um, I am doing with Kieran Healy. Um, Kieran and I were uh, together at the Center for Advanced Studies uh, in the Behavioral Sciences in, at Stanford for a year when the financial crisis hit, so it was 2008, 2009. And I had started at the time a project on classification and uh, actually one of the topics I was working on was on wine. And, you know, wine is great, wonderful topic, but it felt a little bit, um, you know, uh, foolish to be working on wine at uh, such an important time. Uh, and so Kieran and I decided to work on, uh, on the financial crisis and, um, and the transformation of societies uh, as a result of, uh, of financialization. Uh, and so this project is sort of a, a mix of these, my interest and also Kieran's interest in classification and uh, this uh, very momentous series of events that we have seen um, unfold over the last few years. So, uh, the title, originally the title was of, of the paper was Economic Categories in a Neoliberal Society and it was a play uh, on a wonderful paper uh, by Paul Starr called Social Categories and Claims in the Liberal State. Um, and so, trying to get at what we are up to. Um, essentially, our ambition, our theoretical ambition, was to make economic sociology speak to social theory. And specifically, within social theory, uh, I think the uh, part that has actually been forgotten almost, uh, which is class analysis. Um, so in, in a sense, we wanted to produce a theory of social stratification for the neoliberal era. In a, the earlier theories of social stratification, going back to Marx and Weber, of course, were produced at the time of the hegemony of classical liberalism, and now we have a new form of liberalism, neoliberalism, and the question is, you know, how does that um, make us rethink our theories of class? Um, and empirically, uh, we wanted to understand how recent transformations in the way markets uh, work, uh, how that affects social stratification and inequality, or rather because, uh, in fact, this is, right now this is much more of a theoretical project, you know, we wanted to understand how should these transformations in the way uh, markets work, should they affect uh, the way we think about stratification and inequality. And in particular, what we do is we look at transformations in credit markets in the United States. So. Um, let me go back a little bit to our theories of class. Indeed, sociologists like uh, to reach for the cliché that familiar categories are difficult to question, but of course they are hardly immune to the problem themselves. If you consider the analysis of social class, we have a series of approaches that so start from the premise that classes are rooted in production. In the Marxian view, as you very well know, uh, class analysis is about relationships to the means of production. And indeed, the core problem for later Marxists, um, which is exemplified, for instance, by the work of Eric Olin Wright or by John Goldthorpe, has, you know, the problem has been, in fact, to place ambiguous occupations within this underlying uh, relational structure, the relation to the means of production. Uh, and that, in fact, brought Marxist analysis more uh, in line with the Weberian view. Uh, in Weber's work, the idea of intrinsically antagonistic classes gives way to a more refined spectrum of market positions. As you know from his piece um, in Economy and Society, from his chapter on classes, Weber defines uh, an economic, what, what defines an economic class for Weber is a relative similarity of people's life chances. A concept, actually, life chances, uh, that's a concept that Weber never defines very well. But what, determine, what determines life chances further uh, for Weber are individual endowments, what we would now think of as various sorts of capital. 
people own or do not own different sorts of property, or they have different skills uh, that they can bring to market, or various services to buy or sell. So ultimately, for Weber, class situation is about the overall configuration of people's positions on all the different markets. And I uh, just bring you the, this quote, the term class will be used when a certain number of men have in common a specific causal factor influencing their life chances. So the question that is important for, for, for us is this notion of situation on a market. Now still, most scholars since Max Weber have understood the passage on classes to be basically a careful upgrading of Marx's labor market-centered analysis. But we think there is a way to read more into Weber. And for that, we need to go to the end of the passage on economic classes in economy and society, which Weber concludes with a somewhat cryptic reference to a different market, not the labor market, but the credit market. He says the creditor-debtor relation first formed the basis of class situations in the towns. So if we understand Weber correctly, the credit market, not the labor market, is indeed the core structure standing behind social stratification in urban settings. So following this intuition, our argument is that the idea of class situation as life chances on a market, where really the emphasis should be put on the a market, uh, where the nature and the workings of the market becomes the central analytical problem, that insight should be much more broadly applied than it typically is in the lit literature on class analysis. And pe perhaps even, um, you know, it should be even more broadly applied than uh, what Weber uh, himself envisioned. Now, of course, stratification researchers are well aware that there are other forces besides property and occupation or skill, you know, sort of these labor market uh, factors that affect life chances. Of course, you have a lot of stratification research on division between racial and ethnic groups or gender divisions. You know, those are the standard examples. But what we want to argue here is that there are many alternative bases of social division that can be analyzed in their own right as systems of market situations. Each with its own dynamic of stratification. So what is the punchline of this article, which, by the way, just got published um, in, in, in December uh, in, of all places, an accounting journal, Accounting Organizations and Society. Um, so the punchline is this. First, Rather than seeing how categorical differences play out or are expressed or distort different markets, we must see, in fact, how market structures actively construct categories of actors. And when I say market structure, I'm thinking about very specific markets. I'm thinking about, of course, the credit market, but you can think about the healthcare market, you can think about legal services, and increasingly, since you know, this is increasingly uh, a marketplace, education and higher education in particular. Two, what is still missing from this view uh, is the notion that allocation to a particular class might be the result of some classification procedure by market institutions or actors. We want to pursue the intuition found elsewhere in Weber's writing, and particularly in his writings on bureaucracy, that the classification process, if you will, the sorting and slotting of people, is something that is implemented in some organizational procedure often through the use of technologies. You can think for the credit market, you can think redlining, you can think credit scoring, you can think market research. To make that point and emphasize our modification of the Weberian framework, we call these processes classification situations as distinct from Weber's class situations. Okay, so you have Weber saying, you, know, you have this class situation which is a position of people on all of these different markets, and here we're looking at how the markets themselves classify people. Now, of course, classification situations are nothing new, though the term I don't believe has been used uh, elsewhere, uh, but you know, they are traditionally associated with the state. There is, for instance, a considerable scholarship on the construction of racial classification, for instance. The difference here for us is that we are specifically interested in the classificatory practices of market organizations. Our argument 
is that new technologies have increased not only the classifying power of market institutions, but also their ability to link classifications to prices in ways that are, or indeed ought to be, highly consequential for the production or the reproduction of social inequalities. Okay, so in fact, by sorting and slotting people into categories with different re kinds of economic rewards and punishment attached to them, and I'll, I'll explain shortly what I mean, but essentially it's different prices, right? Uh, classification situations arguably structure life chances. Now, let's go back a little bit on why classification situations are important today. Weren't they important before? There have been, in fact, two historical forces be behind the development of classification situations. The first one is technology, namely the growing availability of individual level data on the one hand and the development of statistical models of risk on the other. The second force is the market economy. As representative of the collective goods, uh, of the collective good, states have tended to be politically oriented toward universal mandates. Under state rules, risks were collectivized, socialized, even though the management of such risk might become uh, increasingly individualized. But private corporations are different. They are oriented to profit. In earlier times, some of the risks uh, faced by, for instance, private credit institutions might have been socialized through cross-subsidization. In a sense, you know, you insure, um, uh, you know, you insure the poor at a low price, but then you have, you know, this pool of re really wealthy people that you, um, that actually allow you to sort of offset uh, some of your um, losses. Um, so the, the money that uh, corporations lost administering, for instance, small loans for, in poor neighborhoods, for instance, might have been made up by high profits on large loans in richer neighborhoods. More often, however, banks just shun away from the poor neighborhoods if they could, which, they were, which in fact were often described as banking deserts. Now the new actuarial technologies have changed all that, allowing capitalist firms to monetize individual differences by turning them into individual assessments of risk and turning assessments of risk into economic opportunities through differential pricing strategies. No wonder then that classification situations are especially developed where private markets rather than states are the main organizational form supporting access to primary goods and services such as healthcare, money, insurance or the law. So we are referring here to what political scientists and uh, Hall and Soskis call liberal market economies. So in liberal market economies, this uh, utilization of uh, risk-based pricing is much more common than it is in, say, coordinated market economies, for instance. So indeed, the argument that we are making um, is that neoliberal firms, if you will, or markets under ne neoliberalism thrive on social difference. Indeed, here we take a, a stand against a certain market populism which presumes that markets are fundamentally democratic and egalitarian institutions that are blind to differences in social status and conditions. Uh, in fact, against that, we suggest that markets um, uh, see social differences very well. In fact, modern markets and the neoliberal firms in them thrive on these differences, and that's in part thanks to developments, technical developments such as risk-based pricing and market research. So like states, market institutions strive to make societies more legible, to use James Scott's phrase, in their effort to extort, extract resources from them. Over the last 30 years or so, these efforts have concentrated on the production of increasingly fine knowledge about populations of would-be customers relying on the growing availability of personal data, some, actually, some of which actually is still provided by states. Th through mostly impersonal automated techniques, this knowledge is now incorporated into all kinds of actions by market institutions, from decisions about the location of shopping outlets, to marketing tactics, to pricing strategies. Now, social scientists have been keen to notice the new forms of calculability governmentality and moral regulation embedded in these techniques, and I'm referring here to a whole literature in science and technology studies which sees that very well. 
But the sociologists have really stopped short of examining the implications of these techniques in terms of social stratification and inequality, and this is where we want to go. So let's back up a bit. Historically, market institutions have produced two main kinds of classification situations. The first type, the simplest type of classification situation, we call them boundary classifications. They are the type of classification that, dis, uh, that distinguish people who are inside the market from people who are outside the market. For, for instance, people may be qualified to open a bank account or be denied the ability to do so. They might be able to buy health insurance or car insurance or not. They might have access to credit or not. So I refer to this type as boundary classification or exclusion, if you will. Exclusion indeed is the dominant form of consumption-based classification in most of the world. It is most obvious where supporting institutions are absent or substandard as they often are in the developing world. In most of the world, people are just excluded from certain markets. Now, of course, boundary classifications can be collective or individual. A good example um, uh, of a collective uh, boundary classification is the once widely diffused practice of redlining. Uh, entire neighborhoods on the basis of some social characteristic. Most, you know, in the United States, race uh, has been uh, used uh, quite extensively to exclude people from services. Such collective forms of exclusion are obviously structured by pervasive histories of re institutionally supported racial segregation. But now, today, these kinds of uh, exclusionary classifications are seen as illegitimate, and then they are in fact illegal, uh, because they are perceived to be blatantly discriminatory. And so in the United States, open redlining has been illegal since the 1970s. And uh, you can also not exclude people on the basis of some other characteristic, like gender or marginal status or anything like that. So to give you a little bit of an example, well, since uh, what, uh, to what's happened uh, in the United States, this is the percentage of uh, people having a bank account. And you can see from 1989 to 2007, you know, you can see quite rapidly uh, a rise in uh, the uh, inclusion to the point where today 92% of the population in the United States has, um, has a bank account. So you can see this exclusionary boundary, if you will, uh, receding. There are more people who are inside the market. Uh, just to show you the same data, this is not very uh, clear, but the same data uh, broken down by uh, characteristic. This is in terms of net worth, housing status, employment status, income, age, and ethnicity. And what you can see here is that the population that are traditionally uh, most um, um, behind in terms of uh, of incorporation have all made a very significant gain, gains over uh, the last uh, 20, uh, 20, 30 years. So for instance, you know, uh, the least wealthy uh, have made the most gains here in terms of you know, being including uh, into the banking system. Renters have made most gains. Here, uh, this is un the unemployed have made also a lot of gains. Uh, the poorest uh, this uh, uh, quintile of the American population in terms of income has also, is also the, the, the segment that has uh, caught up, if you will, with the rest of, almost caught up with the rest of the population. Here this is in terms of age, you can see modest gains from, uh, from the youth. And finally, um, non-whites have also made uh, significant gains. Now, this is, so these people are being brought into the banking system over uh, the last uh, 30 years or so. Now the question is, you know, they brought into the banking system, does it mean that they have more access to credit? Not necessarily, and of course this is more complicated because the demand for credit is in part subjective, so it's in part, you know, fueled by people's expectation, but what you can see here is that the percentage of household reporting that they have difficulty uh, obtaining credit actually um, tends to increase in here uh, in the populations that are 
traditionally most, uh, that have the most difficulties. So even though they are incorporated into the banking system, they are not necessarily well incorporated into the credit system, uh, or at least not according to their expectations. Uh, so you can see here, for instance, African Americans uh, are the ones who experience, you know, who have more difficulty. Single parents have more difficulty uh, obtaining credit. Uh, the youth have a little more difficulty as well. And again, the poorest uh, segment of the population, although this, this remains more stable. So that's the first type of market classification, boundary, right? You, are you included in, in the market? And the question is, once you're included, what, does hap what happens to you? The second type of classification situation we call within market classification. Uh, generally speaking, uh, it refers to the positioning of people within a categorical framework on a continuous scale rather than their division into two mutually exclusive groups, the in and out, right? Um, and we, we refer, with that concept, we refer essentially to the segmentation of access to goods and services on the basis of this positioning. For instance, um, uh, in the United States, there's been a massive expansion of the technique known as credit scoring, which is a numerical evaluation of a person's reliability based on his or her individual credit file. And that technique, you know, he's seen as a sort of neutral, objective way of assessing credit worthiness. Uh, and it's seen as a, as a technique that is, in fact, um, that promotes some sort of equality in credit markets. So rather than having the exclusionary system from before where certain kinds of populations, for instance, African Americans were excluded de facto of certain markets, here you have a system where everybody is brought in, but then within the market you have these distinctions based on credit uh, behavior. So it's seen as less discriminatory um, and certainly it complies much better with the law as uh, a very fine uh, sociology um, PhD by Martha Poon uh, has shown. Um, and these techniques are individualized and they are impersonally uh, administered. Now, within market classifications exist in all kinds of domains and indeed they allow, if you will, capitalistic activities and the extraction of profit to reach further in both breadth and depth through the ever finer segmentation of populations. Corporations, for instance, keep records of their customers' purchasing behavior or they buy those records from other companies and that enhances the power of marketing. Within the, and then when these classifications are tied to material and symbolic reward system, however, two things happen. Uh, first, classifications now have a moral content in the sense that they track the person action dynamically and reflect on his or her evolving moral self. So if you will, uh, there's a sort of implicit ethic of improvement that is built into uh, the market surveillance technique. And the technique itself requires proper self-management by, uh, by individuals. So as such, as uh, Donna Cameron um, has shown, the sorting and scoring of people is dynamic productive and disciplinary, if you, you know, to take the Foucauldian um, sort of vocabulary. The underlying structure um, is subjectively incorporated by individuals um, and people strive to actually manage uh, their credit identity, for instance. And indeed you find, if you go online, you will find all kinds of companies that, are, that will sell you FICO uh, management toolkits you know, uh, to, to help you manage your credit score. So credit scoring is a good example of that. If you look at uh, this is, uh, 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 FICO is the main company producing credit scores. In, you know, they, they have over 90% of the market for credit scoring in the United States. And um, uh, this is what they tell us they do. We, we will never know for sure because this is, a, and this is a sort of their own individual algorithm. But they tell you that essentially, mm. yeah, I don't know if it's, ah, it's a little better. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah it's, it's a little better. So, you know, so your, your credit score depends on whether you make on-time payments, um, how much of your credit line you're using, what types of credit do you mix, 
if you have a lot of credit inquiries that you make and of course the length of your credit history and all of that is aggregated into some kind of, through some kind of algorithm and that produces the credit score. And so, you know, in, individuals can, uh, through their behavioral, through the management of their own credit behavior, try to um, uh, affect these different components of the credit score. Um, the quantification, and, and this is very important because the quantification of individual performance through instruments like the FICO score determines which services can be obtained and at which price. So the flip side of market inclusion has been an acceleration of market segmentation. Hard to reach populations have been incorporated as I showed you, you know, in, uh, earlier in the slides. Uh, but, you know, this has happened only uh, so that they could be matched to carefully uh, tailored industries and products. Okay, now by the way, this is also happening in other markets such as health uh, insurance, even with the uh, uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, insurance companies are allowed to charge uh, people who smoke, you know, a premium so that, you know, the behavior is actually incorporated in the price that people have to pay for insurance. It's not in every state, but it, it, uh, it, happens, um, uh, it happens in a number of them. So that's sort of the logic that we have in credit. You know, your FICO score determines the terms of the credits that you will have access to. To give you an example here from a, um, a textbook on the management of consumer credits, imagining it's a bank management textbook, uh, you, imagine, you receive these credit applications, you try to consider, so the first thing you consider is you know, where people fit in the credit score scale. Uh, if they have a credit score, say above, eight, 875, they fall in a particular category. If they fall below, they have, it's a different category. And then you take into account their income. You take into account whether you know them, if they're an existing customer or not. And then uh, you will uh, uh, give out loans uh, depending on that. So this kind of management shows two things. First, it shows that the persistence of, of a boundary classification. If I look here, um, you have this footnote that cases with a credit score below 760 were rejected outright. So these people cannot even pretend to receive a loan in this, in this particular example. So the, the boundary classification is still very much part of the story. But the other side, of course, of the story is this what we call within market classification, right? Which is that the interest rate that you will pay on your loan depends very much on where you fit in this sort of, uh, if you will, tree of classification, right? So if your income um, is below $40,000 and you're not an existing customer and your credit score is on the lower side, you'll pay so close to 13% on your loan. And then if you're at the top, you know, with a high income and, you know, a nice credit score, then you'll pay close to 8%. So a very significant difference in um, in the kind of uh, 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 product that you can have, a uh, loan product that you can have access to. And meanwhile, you know, uh, mind you, this is for people who are actually pretty healthy. You know, their credit score is actually pretty high. In the midst of the subprime prime crisis, uh, institutions were lending at much, much lower credit scores. So what does the world of credit look like today? Mainstream credit. It looks very much like this, you know. Uh, people are incorporated through the credit score into a credit scale, um, and the loan amount, uh, of course, as, you know, as the credit score goes up, you can lend more at a lower interest rate. Now the question, and this is uh, typically around 620, you have what is called a subprime cutoff. That is, uh, it's the non-conventional loans that the um, that the federal government, in the case of, um, in the case of, uh, of mortgage loans, the federal government won't uh, 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 guarantee those loans. Um, so the question is, you know, what, hap what happens here, right? What happens below that? Um, so you have, you know, um, so the flip side, if you will, of market inclusion has been this acceleration of market segmentation 
you know, this matching of population differentiated through market devices, and they are matched to economically differentiated industries and products. And these are seen uh, as entirely uh, legitimate. The question is, you know, what happens below a certain level? Is there a, a lumpen scoretariat? You know, is there a sort of a score under which, you know, uh, people are actually not completely, you know, they're still part of the class system, but they are not, you know, they're, 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 they're at the bottom of it. And indeed, at the bottom of the scoring scale are those who either do not have a score because they don't, they don't use the mainstream, uh, mainstream credit system, or those whose score is so low uh, that it only serves to permanently maintain them outside of the system. And indeed, there is a profound exclusionary boundary that still cuts through the Raja inclusionary world of credit uh, scoring, and that's the existence of a stubborn strata of unscorable and unscored at the bottom end, what we call a lumpen scoretariat. And of course, the lumpen scoretariat intersects closely with the country's poor, as well as with the uh, minorities and immigrant populations. And importantly, it also intersects with the, with the young, because the young don't have a credit history. So how are the credit needs of this population met? Well, it turns out that, in fact, there's a whole economy out there um, that uh, exists. Um, and I'm thinking here mostly of sort of small, the small loan business, but there are all kinds of ways of obtaining credit at the low end of the scoring scale and, and legitimate ways. We're not talking about loan sharks here. Uh, the only thing that these uh, lending systems have in common is that they are prohibitively expensive. Uh, and here I'm referring to things like um, rent to own, auto title loans, tax refund anticipation loans, payday loans, uh, and of course, uh, at the very bottom, the check cashers and so on. Um, uh, today in the United States, um, uh, there's about 20 million uh, people who have a checking account and who use uh, payday loans. Um, uh, but of course, so that's not much. You know, the incidence for uh, the uh, overall population is about 4%, but in some neighborhoods, it's very, very dominant. Um, so, what, uh, what are we talking about here? And what's, what's remarkable here is that, actually I should be uh, saying that, because, so if the interest rates in the mainstream credit market, you know, was, you know, uh, a, a sort of single digit and, and not going very high, uh, even at the low end of that market, in the fringe market, the, the interest rates balloon completely. So uh, in the case of uh, things like payday loan, um, economists have calculated that uh, interest rates, if annualized, uh, can reach up to almost close to 800% a year. And these are small loans. So payday loans are small loans of um, typically $300, and people pay a fee of $50 to have a loan for two weeks. So two weeks later, um, you know, they have to, um, to pay back the loan plus the fee. Um, so it's, you know, if you do that every two weeks and you refinance your loan that way, you end up with, a, you know, paying several times uh, uh, your loan over the course of one year. Um, and I want to show you that this is indeed a meaningful, this particular uh, classification situation, you know, people who are incorporated into the banking system but have no real access to, to credit is in fact very well understood. Uh, by, um, um, by the market uh, as a very meaningful business category. This is just an example from a website called, uh, from a company called Cash America, which runs uh, a lot of these small loans uh, companies. And they have this particular category, where they, they say we serve the underbanked population. So you click, what is the underbank? Am I underbanked or not? Well, it's a person with a bank account but limited access to credit. So it's exactly the kind of population that got incorporated into the credit system, into the banking system um, in the data that I showed you earlier. Um, to give you an example of the growth of the industry since the mid-1990s, uh, this is the number of payday lending outlets, uh, the, the squares are the number of payday lending outlets 
1997, uh, you had about a thousand payday lending outlets in the United States, and the peak was reached in 2006, uh, where we had about 24,000 payday lending outlets across the country. It's, it's still, it has gone down since then, in part because some states have cracked down on the industry. But you have to account for the fact that about one-fourth of the payday lending business today is done online. So in fact, if you think about the business as a whole, it hasn't decreased that much. Um, this, the, uh, this is the number of uh, tax refund anticipation loan outlets and, uh, for one company. I couldn't get for the whole industry. Uh, this is just the Jackson Hewitt, which is one, uh, one big company. And you can see here again as well that there's been... Um, there's been a rise of, these, uh, of this business. Now the question is, um, you know, that, well, so we have these industries, we have this tracking of people, we have this differentiation through uh, the terms of credit. Now the question is, you know, why would people actually go there and take on these products? And indeed, it, here it's important to realize that market classifications have an objective and a subjective dimension. So we need to understand not only how the classifications are materially produced, but also how people come to fit in them, subjectively, if you will, or sort themselves into them. So in short, we want to know how these classification situations are discovered and managed, how the proposed products are differentiated and tailored, and how they are adjusted to the taste and the comfort level of the people that they target. If you will, we want to understand how the supply and the demand of the market meet, sociologically speaking. Um, so to give you some tentative insights on this, um, we, uh, we want to uh, sort of propose a, a framework. Um, the other side of the coin, I mean, for, for us, the, 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 the best insight about the, to think about these issues come from the most culturally oriented economic sociology. Essentially, uh, Paul Di Maggio, um, uh, Viviana Zelizer, and Pierre Bourdieu. And even, actually, I found out precursors, um, uh, there's a guy named Pierre Martineau, who was a director of research and market marketing at the Chicago Tribune, who it turns out is very important for this story. Anyway, the point of this literature is that it's a literature that allows us to understand the articulation between a production structure and a taste structure. Um, in classification in art, for instance, Paul Di Maggio shows that artistic genre both reflect an underlying taste, taste structure within the population and the structure of distribution and production of cultural goods. So in other words, organizations in cultural markets propose a menu from which people choose, so you cannot think about consumption without thinking about production. But because the menu is also derived from these organizations' representations of the distribution of taste in the population, um, you cannot think about production itself independently from the consumption side. So it's important to understand this articulation between the two. And our argument is that we can think about these financial markets in exactly the same way. Financial market organizations propose a menu of services to a population known through some instrumental categorization uh, and often um, these people, you know, actually, Sorry, uh, and these people come to market to the organization, market organizations first through their objective constraints, but second through this uh, this form of subjective fitting that we are trying to explore. And um, what we show in the paper is that, in fact, we can, uh, if you will, think about uh, three major trajectories in people's relationship to and subjective experience of credit in the United States, at the bottom end of the social scale, among the poor, we talk about, uh, actually here we follow Bourdieu, a taste for necessity, and this is the, the whole economy of payday loan and uh, rent to own and so on, is in fact exploiting this particular type of, um, of economy. Uh, among the lower middle class and into the riches of the upper middle class, we have a sort of economic goodwill and suffering manage the management of, um, of uh, people's uh, credit trajectories through the credit score. And at the top, 
the credit score is actually something that liberates people because it allows them to accumulate um, assets uh, in a cheap way. Uh, so the, if you will, people benefit from uh, their own, um, their, their material and subjective appreciation uh, through, uh, through the score. Uh, so I don't have time here to go into all three of the trajectories. I'll just illustrate the bottom one because I've talked about the, uh, the fringe banking economy. So I'll talk about the taste for necessity. Um, so how do we account for the blossoming of these fringe banking economies since roughly it started in the late 1980s? Um, so one thing is, you know, there's a material uh, necessity in the sense that, uh, as we said, people uh, might need credit more, uh, partly because there's been a retreat from the welfare state, partly because real wages have been essentially stagnant, if not actually have gone down for the bottom end of the labor market, because people face more costs like spiraling healthcare costs and so on. So in fact, these industries are actually benefiting from a changing material situation. The question for us is how do you go from that to going into to understanding the subjective feeding? Well, in part it's because these services are everywhere. So in fact, um, uh, we used um, focus groups that the Center for Responsible Lending conducted among users of payday loans. And uh, these people uh, are essentially telling a very familiar story. If you know your town, you see them around, like in the shopping strip, strip malls and such. You know, the, the services are very present. So if you look, for instance, at the map um, of the United States, you can see uh, that these services tend to be concentrated um, in uh, the south and then the west of the, of the United States. And then there are a number of states where these services are actually uh, uh, illegal. So material, uh, this, this differential implantation is in part, uh, is part of the story. Uh, very often they are associated with other pop services that are popular with the poor, such as money orders and pawn shops. The other thing that comes up a lot in this uh, Center for Responsible Lending focus groups is the simplicity of form, uh, the aggressive mar marketing uh, of uh, the payday lenders. So uh, a lot of people are saying, you know, you know what you're getting up front. You know, you come in, you pay your fee, your $50 fee, you come out, you have your loan. It's very simple. Uh, as opposed to um, the banks, um, which uh, uh, have over the last 20, 30 years, change massively how they deal with uh, these customers. So they have welcomed the customers. So the customers have a bank account now, uh, but they are being hit by all of these hidden fees uh, after the fact. So a lot of people uh, in the credit, in the, um, in the uh, focus group interviews were uh, con uh, expressing this very negative comparison with their experience of the bank. So if I walk into the bank, they will charge me right away. Um, They've had a lot of negative bank counter uh, interactions. Indeed, if you look at the, you know, when, pe when people decide not to have a checking account, uh, you see the reasons have changed massively over the last uh, 20 years. And by and large, things that you would think are sort of economic reasons, like the service charges are too high or the minimum balance are too high, they don't. There's not much of a change here. But the real thing that changes is, you know, I hate the banks, basically. Um, so, you know, the, the banks have incorporated these people, but the subjective experience is actually one of alienation, both an economic alienation and, of course, a symbolic alienation. The other thing that is important uh, in terms of understanding this subjective fitting is what we could call economic virtue, you know, how people explain why they are resorting to things like payday loans. Um, a lot of people are, um, were reporting that they are feeling more in control. You know, the bank, uh, because they're using these overdraft fees, it's something that is imposed by the bank. Whereas a payday loan, I actually walk in, I have to make this sort of proactive uh, decision to show uh, that I am coming uh, into, um, 
um, to, to, to obtain that loan. And people are actually feeling virtuous, which was one of the big surprises uh, when, when we looked at the, uh, the focus group interviews that the center uh, allowed us to, uh, to read, that people were feeling that the fact that they had to come back every two weeks for these return visits, the, um, people saw that as a disciplining mechanism uh, compared to credit cards. Uh, they said, you know, if I have plastic in my pocket, I will max it out right away. Whereas if I have to go to the payday loan, even if I end up paying over the course of a year something like 700% uh, in interest rate, right? Um, but at least I know every week, you know, what I have to pay. So it's the sort of this interesting dissociation. And then there is, of course, this feeling at home. People feel sociological affinities with staff and with uh, other customers. So um, a lot of people are sort of mentioning that um, it does not feel like a bank. You walk into your pet alone office and it looks more like a DMV or a post office. It doesn't feel like a bank, which would be, you know, more um, of pudding. Uh, here's a quote from an article in the New York Times. Uh, at JP Morgan, where Mr. Dueno keeps a checking account, so here's an account with uh, JP Morgan. When I walk in, I feel very sm small and not particularly important, but here in the Advanced America office, which is a petty lender, I feel respected. Okay? So, if, in order to understand, you know, this subjective feeding into this sort of new, uh, new economy of, of credit, uh, we have to understand the differentiated dispositions in a way that people care, if you will, about the form of exchange. This is a, something that Vivian Azeliza told us about. But they care about it in ways that are patterned by their social experience. And this is the insight that we take from Bourdieu. You put the two together um, and you have um, sort of a, a, an insight into uh, the current uh, economy of payday lending. Um, so, in fact, the, if you will, the restricted set of options becomes turned into a practical strategy for people that finds its own justification. And so it is perhaps not so surprising that in the focus groups, it is precisely those people who have historically been the most constrained in terms of access to mainstream credit, but I'm thinking here of African Americans, these are the people who, in fact, express the greatest support for the institution of payday lending. So... Uh, in, in, in the interviews, whites use uh, words like being raped, selling their blood, and feeling guilty. But African Americans and some Hispanics justify the very high rate practiced by payday lender by saying things like, I do think it's fair because you go in there knowing. You know what you need, you know what you're going to pay. They're taking a huge risk, risk. they're not doing credit checks. A woman even going to Sacramento to defend legislation favorable to payday lender. So, while you know, there is certainly an ambivalence uh, of, of this population toward payday lenders as you know, seen as exploitative, um, the African Americans were still more likely to see payday lending as a necessary and socially useful evil, affording them more dignity than other types of financial help, such as relying on charity or welfare. Uh, so in fact, here, the, you, know, you can see how financial exclusion tended to foster the conditions of its own acceptance. And of course, whites were much more, you know, had a much stronger um, uh, dislike, expressed a much stronger dislike of the system of payday lending, but it's in part in reference to a history that is very different for them. They had always more access to credit. So, to conclude, the people who have been given who are given, if you will, rotten terms in the market because they are more risky, are also more likely to remain more risky or even become riskier because the terms they have to work with are so rotten to begin with. So in fact, by facilitating differential pricing and terms of access to goods and services across a wide range of domains, credit scoring and then you know, the various forms of credit that have popped up in the last 30 years, uh, becomes, you know, become an active independent force that structure people's life chances via their financial position. If you will, it can be understood as a sort of vector multiplier of social position conceived in a traditional way. Once established, in fact, the score percolates into every aspect of people's lives. 
such as insurance, employment, real estate, or even dating. So try, for instance, in a, in a hot um, a real estate market like California, try to rent an apartment without a good credit score, and you will, you know, you will see that how difficult that might be. Um, so, from the point of view of the business, the argument is that the increasing spreads are seen as rational for lenders. Indeed, they are seen as a condition of them staying in business to serve the underserved uh, population. Uh, but of course, people learn to look at this, uh, on the other hand, uh, on, on the other side, you know, the subjective fitting I was talking about, people learn to look at these risky loans are in fact legitimate choices that are made for them. And they learn to accept risky terms as, as sort of these things uh, that are uh, better than nothing uh, and that, de that definitely have um, uh, this, uh, this individualized quality in the sense they, they learn to understand their own, um, um, the high prices that they face on the credit market as uh, not something that is dictated by harsh structural circumstances that they face, but in fact as something that is the product of their own bad behavior in the past. Right? So in fact, the credit, through this system, credit is being moralized. Um, so indeed, harsh circumstances and the power of differentiated markets really disappear from view in this new neoliberal system, if you will. All that is left are good or bad individual choices that are mechanically recorded. And indeed, even today, you know, even paid and lender have their own scoring system, so the whole system is actually being uh, mechanized uh, in this way. And as I said earlier, the score percolates into every aspect of life. Um, so, this is an attempt, if you will, this paper is an attempt to rethink class analysis through the prism of the techno-social changes that have happened over the last 30 years. So one of the essential elements here is the appearance of a credit scoring system which has allowed for the massive incorporation of a of, uh, population that was previously excluded from the credit market into first the banking system. And then because they are, you know, now they have a bank account, they can have access to these new products that are called uh, payday loans. I forgot to mention a very important thing. In order to have access to a payday loan, you need to have a bank account. So in fact, the, uh, the existence of this inclusion into the banking system is what allows the whole industry of payday lending to exist in the very first place. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, there was a debate that was centered on the notion that the poor pay more. Now, of course, with the great society and the expansion of welfare programs, that sort of notion waned. But its main idea that being poor costs money and that firms looking to do business with the poor know and exploit this systematically, that main idea is worth retooling perhaps for a neoliberal era where debt has become a lot more expensive at the bottom end of the social scale. And it has become more expensive in the way that is now seen as legitimate. It's not to say that... Um, People couldn't contract debts at a high prices before. There were loan sharks before, but what's really new is the, new, uh, the fact that the system is now, these systems are now completely seen as uh, legitimate. So the second point that we want to emphasize here is that it's, it's not simply the poor that pay more uh, uh, in, this, in this new system, but it's in fact much more specific categories of people which are measured and targeted by heavily moralized market instruments and highly differentiated market institutions. And it is in that very precise way that classification situations, we argue, have become the engine or the modern engine of class situations. So I'll stop here. Thank you for listening to me. We will let you appeal your own questions. Okay. I'll ask the first question. It was a very interesting talk, and you talk, You started out by saying that we're going from production and class analysis to the market, but isn't really what you're talking about a lot really the shift to financialization, finance? All your examples are practically from finance? Yes. So I talk about finance because that's the main example that we, um, you know, we develop here, but you can think uh, in some ways that this is a much more general mechanism, and if 
um, I want to be like a Cassandra here. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll outline a future where we will all be ranked and rated on some sort of measure uh, for every possible purpose. So, for instance, um, there are today uh, companies that are integrating all your medical information so that I imagine that the day is not very far when you will also have a medical score, right? And that will also shape what you have access to on, uh, on the health insurance market. And of course the medical score will be also a score that will depend on your behavior, right? It will, you know, if you smoke, if you're fat, if you, and so on and so forth. So all of that will be integrated and, and in a way it's, it will be in the same way that credit has become, it will be a moralization, if you will, of behavior that is traditionally associated with more structural difficulties. So, you know, that's an example. But, you know, if you want to think about uh, dating and so on, I mean, these new, you know, there are today, again, you know, companies that are um, scoring people on their... Um, desirability as uh, partners and so on and so forth. So, you know, you, you, you can imagine that uh, living in a world where on practically every market, the healthcare market, the uh, dating market, if you will, the credit market, you will have the different instruments. And, and that the instruments will actually move from one market to the other. So already um, Credit score is being used by insurance for all kinds of, you know, in, in all kinds of different ways. But you can imagine that medical scores might be also used in the credit market. You know, it's, it's a, exactly. Or in the credit, <laughs> yeah, you can go to a website that's, that is called datemycreditscore.com, right? And you'll see. You yes. I like the talk very much, and it seemed to me that the old Marxist idea of class was a structural idea. Mm -hmm. uh, that the, the whole working class uh, was a, not just a classification, but it was a structural location mm -hmm. that was very, very hard to shed and intergenerational. But then the, the classification driven by technology is closer to what we professors do. It's a grading system. Yes. Um, it's not yes. in the status Yes. Uh, this demographic status is not a race, it's not eth ethnicity or gender, but it's a great grade you get. Mm -hmm. If you uh, don't get speaking tickets and if you don't get, uh, not a drug driver, you get a, a cheaper insurance rate. And if you pay your debt in time and uh, you are a yeah. reliable character, you get a higher, better score. Mm -hmm. And so in that classification system, you can improve yourself, just as Absolutely. you're grading. Uh, that, 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 that it is a uh, meritocratic system, yes. uh, where if you be, meet the condition that you stop smoking, mm -hmm. well, that would give you a higher grade yeah. uh, in this system. So in that sense, it isn't really a class idea in a way, but static structural characteristic that you can't shed. Yes. Uh, but there may be something deeper in the class that defines people as the people who go to the payday loan. Mm -hmm. um, so the people who go to the payday loan are typically the ones who are not, you know, lurking behind that not good in that system because they're. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you and this is exactly what we're trying to capture, so I'm glad that that message got across because, uh, you know, we, we have moved in, in the era of classical liberalism, class is indeed, you know, seen in this very structural way. In the era of neoliberalism, what we have is uh, an individualized classification system, which, by the way, uh, becomes much more heavily moralized, right, in the sense that if you end in one particular location, of the classificatory system, it is essentially your own, by your own doing. I mean, that's the assumption, right? And what is, um, what we find uh, really troubling, if you will, in this world is that precisely the structural factors disappear from you, right? If, if the reason why you didn't pay, you know, your credit card bill is because you have faced some particularly harsh you know, condition and employment and so on, that, you know, at the lower end of the social scale, life is more unstable and so on, 
that disappears from view, it becomes sort of understood in this very heavily moralized system as, you know, you didn't pay, you were not responsible, right? So the structural factors uh, are actually sort of uh, in this system are, are in fact uh, purged out of the system, right? Because the, the score becomes a reflection of your own behavior. Right, but in the, the, the analogy of the grade, uh, we, when we assign a low grade to students, mm -hmm. we assign it based on the funds, but we hope that they improve. Mm -hmm. And we oh, yeah. in the new incentives that if you improve, we'll give you the better. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the so, same thing with the smoking cost. Yeah. for life insurance, yeah. for uh, health insurance, that we hope that you stop smoking so that you can benefit yes. from a better policy. Yeah, I mean, that's the idea. And indeed, I mean, I think that uh, in, in that sense, people are not, you know, can move across, in that, in that scheme, people can move across social vacation. So you can perfectly imagine somebody who's, you know, not making very much, mo very much money, but who has a very good credit score because they're, you know, they're they're behaving in a particular way. But that said, a lot of structural factors are still not, you know, are which might very much influence the way in which people um, uh, uh, are positioned in that scale. But they will not be understood in that sort of way, you know. And that's, you know, that's partly the, the tension here. So the idea is that is this actually, you know, is this producing a different basis for, for a class system that is still there, in fact? Yes. Yeah. Uh, a question about sort of the criteria that are used in the classification system. Mm -hmm. um, and I can imagine two criteria and a third possibility, but I'm not sure if it would be ever used, but partly I'm asking about that third one. But the two I can easily imagine, I think you referred to, on the one hand is sort of um, previous behavioral outcomes. So if you got sick before, or you were in an accident, Mm -hmm. Second are things, behaviors which might not directly lead to any outcome, but which we kind of negatively evaluate. So you drink, yeah. smoke, or something that's seen as a personal choice that is, yeah. that is predictive of yes. bad outcomes and mm -hmm. is also disproved of. Yes. Then third, there would be other predictive characteristics which we don't think of as moral choices or bad choices. So you live in a snowy area and a lot of people get nice and Mm -hmm. you know, or something of that sort, yeah. um, which, again, you, you haven't had the, the, the accident yet, no. it's not your behavior, and it's not seen as a poor choice if somebody has to live in the mm -hmm. desert or a little, you know, un unfortunate part of your country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so, okay, those third things enter into the credit score in the way um, people operation I don't think they. I don't think they are there. I don't think. I, I don't believe any. I don't. I don't believe any of that is there because the. Yeah, they're predictive. Uh, I mean, I don't know. You know that 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 is in part one of the issues um, that we're dealing with with this particular research is that these scores are themselves trade secrets, so you can't know. It. So there is. Uh, a marketing uh, literature from FICO, you know, telling you what they're using, yeah. but, you know, for all I know, they could use my, you know, people's, I don't know, they cannot use race, but they could use, I don't know, um, certain food choices, you know, we, because of credit reporting, you know where people go, eat their, you know, so you could use, I don't know, laundry soap or food choices uh, that are strongly predictive of race, and you would have a proxy that would actually work. So, you know, you, you, you would, there's all kinds of things that could, ha and they could, you know, you could think of other, a lot of other things that would be predictive that could be used. But I, you know, at this point, I don't know because it's not, you know, this is not something that is actually, um, um, yeah, I mean, that, that known by the by the public. And maybe this is actually something that should be known by the public. Let me try an analog of the third space because I was thinking of this too, but maybe this is the analog of the third space. No, I'm not sure, but. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, the story at the bottom is if it, it's resonant, and I, mean, I, I can see the story. And the story at the top is, is also resonant. But let me just try it another way. In a sense, credit is a kind of asset today, mm -hmm. uh, which it really wasn't in the, the, um, the, the old Marx yes. and the production. But what about the middle? 
that's not in the story. In other words, maybe you have another classification there. But can you, I can imagine people, you know, people who are so, so proud that they pay off their mortgage or they pay yeah. off their bills or they pay off something. And it seems to me those people somehow are the in-between group or whatever that kind of lose in both of these systems. I mean, they're not the kind of people who are going to want to have yeah. a payday. Yeah. But they're going to be the people who are kind of disadvantaged in this asset. They're also going to be disadvantaged in this asset accumulation yeah. that you do get when you're, you're doing at the top. So, um, and they're going to develop resentments against the top and the bottom of that system because mm -hmm. they kind of lose on both. Yeah. <laughs> they're not rich enough. Yeah. For is that, does that figure in any way? In the, in yeah. the, is that living in the snow? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's very interesting because, in a sense, you're right that the middle is where the action is because at the top people have, you know, well, it's complicated because yeah, is, no, is, the top, right. is the top the top of the scoring scale or is it the top of the income scale or wealth scale, right? And they don't, have to and they, it, and they don't overlap. So what you find is that the people who get, have the highest credit scores are typically, the, of course, they are, tend to be wealthier. <laughs> they, tend to, you know, they tend to do better financially, but mostly they are educated. Yeah. So it's the most educated who have the highest credit score. So in fact, I mean, I wish I could show you, but I know that it doesn't show very well. Because we did a correspondence analysis. Um, uh, of data from the financial capability survey, which is one of the interesting surveys. So you can't see very well, so that's why we didn't, you know, we didn't really sh show this. But essentially, um, the uh, the blue variables are all the variables related to credit, and then the red variables are all the sort of demographic variables. And what you can see, I mean, you can see very well, but you know, the credit score, the higher credit score is, of course, clo you know, on the higher end of the income scale, but it's mostly associated, it's very much associated with higher education. Um, and then you have, um, I wish I could show you the, so at the top, of this, you know, you have high, you know, high score, high education, high income at the bottom, you know, you have this. But then the other thing that was, we found that was, and this is, this is the project we're working on right now, that really structures the space, if you will, of the use of, of, of credit, is, you know, the people who are in the credit economy versus the people who are not in the credit economy. Not in the credit economy, you have the use, and you have the retired, you know, who are paid off essentially. Um, and what structures that space very much is actually the number of kids. So you can see, you know, it's like the, the real action for the credit economy is the middle class with children, basically. You know, yeah, um, not too young, not too old, but, you know, with children. And this is where you have a lot of action. So you can define, you know, sort of different space. We call them the virtuous and the paid off, the indebted better off. Then the credit as welfare people, so this is the payday, cash advance, all of these people who are using the, uh, and then very, very far, you know, uh, you have the completely excluded that I don't, I don't even show you because they are so far out of the space. And these are the people who use uh, the check cashers. Um, but, you know, so you, you can see that the demographic characteristic map in part onto the credit characteristic and, 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 and the use of the credit system. So it's in part the kind of things that we are trying to do. So it's a more Bourdieu, that's a more Bourdieuian part of the project. It's so, sort of trying to understand the credit economy as sort of yielding these different trajectories, these different social, so, and fairly stable social trajectories, um, depending on um, your education, uh, your, uh, your, cultural, uh, your cultural and economic capital. I had questions in the back. Yeah, I'm going to come back to the earlier point about the differences between this economy and the labor economy. And, one th and I really like the way you've drawn the, the kind of morality of credit scores and indebtedness because after, um, I sort of wondered after the housing bubble for us and, and all the credit collapsed, why there wasn't a debtors union. Yeah. And I think it's because of the stigma attached that you're describing. Mm -hmm. that yes. You're morally unsightly if you're admitting you have a debt, that, you know, that you're in debt or that you're 
underwater or whatever that makes it hard for you to come into public because almost like an AA thing. Mm -hmm. That is an thing where everyone would have to come and admit yes. that they had a problem before people could organize them. It's a very different, very different than working in a factory or being in a place where everybody's doing the same thing and you're likely to be organized based on this class or caste occupational. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, actually, the paper was originally called Economies, Categories, and Claims in Neoliberal Society because Paul Starr's piece is called Social Categories and Claims in the Liberal State. And the point of Paul Starr's is actually to show how cat state provided categori social categorization give rise to certain kinds of politics. So, so the idea we had is that we will, you know, then, then we realized it was way too much to swallow for one paper and so, you know, turn to. But, um, but yes, there is this very important dimension of, you know, what kind of politics. So if, we're, if, if this is a new basis for a class, and, well, is this a basis for a new type of class analysis, then where is the political piece, you know, that is missing? Uh, you know, will we have something like uh, 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 un underscored of the worlds unite? Or, you know, will we have, you know, is, is it, but clearly the politics has to be uh, with that machine. Um, let me go back to, uh, oh, I can't find it. I want, it has to be with the, with the FICO score. Oh, well. Oh, I can't find it anymore now. Oh, well. I wanted to find that pie chart. Um, oh, yeah, there it is. There it is. That pie chart, you know, this is where the politics has to be, of course, right? Um, what, are the, what are the criteria according to which people are being judged, right? Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of things that we don't know, but um, in, in part, things that sometimes look like they are the result of individual decision making are, in fact, not at all individual. So, for instance, and this is a point that actually um, this student I was talking about, Martha Poon, she's a UCSD PhD, she's written a beautiful uh, dissertation on credit scoring. She's a point that, it's a point that she um, made very forcefully to me. You know, if the bank drops suddenly, you know, its credit line limit, then suddenly people's, you know, use of their credit line will, you know, automatically, if you will, will rise up, right? So that will affect their credit score. So in fact, the credit score can be very much affected by all kinds of behaviors by the bank. It is also well known, I, I actually remember driving in a cab um, in freezing Chicago, and the guy was a part-time uh, real estate uh, mortgage broker. And he was telling me how, uh, how um, people who are not, uh, how did he put it? Uh, not very, uh, well, savory, or I, I forgot how he put it, but how they would do a lot of credit inquiries before securing, you know, before uh, giving out a loan so that, in fact, the credit score would, uh, would go down. So, you know, as, as if you, like, if you sh you're, you're shopping for a car and you're doing all kinds of credit inquiries in, you know, in a, in a, uh, in a diff, um, uh, 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 with different car dealers, for instance, trying to look for the best price, well, they will all ask you for your credit score. Well, if you have a lot, then suddenly, you know, that will affect. It's 10%. Credit inquiry is 10% of your credit score. So, you know, so, so there's all kinds of things within the, you know, in the credit score that are, in fact, managed by third parties that have nothing to do with anything that you did. But yet, it is recorded as such, and that's, what's, that, that's what is so, uh, so interesting. And so that's why it should, you know, it's, it's the basis for new kinds of politics. You know, not the old working class politics. Yes. These reasons that you mentioned, I'm a bit skeptical as to the self disciplining nature of the classification. Um, and so to answer partly the question, is there a classification? It might be those that can afford the classification, which are going to be So for those who, you know, don't normally have access to this information, they'll find out on a given event that might happen infrequently. Not alone, mm -hmm. happens, but they might not 
TSA, fast pass, FDR pool. Those that pay to access their health care mm -hmm. themselves. All those people that actually paid for that information, even though that information was launched to by other structural mm -hmm. constraints, or perhaps those that have the new kind of type of class that exists, the class that actually pays to have access to information about them, mm -hmm. as opposed to just being right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, uh, it's very clear that you need you in the data that we have uh, from the fi it's it's a survey called the financial capability survey. Uh, you see that the likelihood of checking your credit score rises with with income, although it plateaus uh, in education and it plateaus um, it plateaus at the at the top. Um, so at the bottom, people, you know, people, but there. Again, there's an education, I mean, this is a relatively new system, right? So uh, populations are changing very massively. Be people become very aware of, uh, of that credit score. And in fact, sometimes the use of uh, things like payday loans is, people use payday loan precisely because it's not recorded in the mainstream credit system. And so whatever happens there is actually not going to affect that credit, their credit score. So in fact, it, you know, even at the bottom, not the very, very bottom, because there people have no score. But, you know, um, e even among low-income people, you still have, uh, you know, an acknowledgement of, of the score. And now, you know, and then there are these laws that, you know, you can, you have at least one free, you can check your credit score once per year for free. So, yes. Yeah. No, it's. I, mean, I don't think it is. Uh, I don't believe it is because you know you. I mean, these. You know, it is expensive to administer a very very small loan. Um, I, I'm not sure that. Well, let me put it this way. I'm not sure that it is more profitable. But I know it's a, there is a very flourishing industry around it. Um, um, but I don't know. I, I wouldn't know how to compare. You know, to sort of mainstream lending. Um, but what is true, what is true, I have, uh, I don't believe I have a slide for this, but what is true is that uh, banks now uh, make a much larger um, uh, proportion of their profit from their fees than they used to. So, you know, I mean, that's one way of measuring this, is that in fact, you know, banks are competing very, very heavily for the top clients. They don't make much money on these clients, right, for the, for the people who are, have high incomes and who pay uh, very well. And then, you know, they make up a lot of that by, um, by hammering the rest with, with fees. So in fact, you could say that the bottom could be subsidizing the whole, you know, the whole structure. But, uh, you know, I don't have good, so good data. Go yeah, exactly, exactly. That's that's very, exactly, because for them, it's, you know, it's actually not irrational to go to the penny lender in that sort of new system. Absolutely. You know, I was thinking of these places that you see, like, or maybe I'm going to notice now if you see less of them, but these <laughs> places like check cash, and I mean, yeah. sort of have to see. I mean, that, that doesn't enter. I, I well, check cashing is different because check, check cashing has been around for a much yeah. longer time. Here, the paid loan is a very particular yeah, niche because yeah, it's, it's really linked to the incorporation into the banking system because you need to be able to write a check against yourself, you know, two weeks How from now. How would I find one of these? I mean, if I was looking for one. Payday lenders, a lot, of, a lot of check cashers, a lot of check cashers have moved into the payday lending business. So in part, it's, you know, it grew, it grew out of that. Uh, pawn shops have moved into the payday lending business. I mean, there in there. Oakland, they're all over. Yeah, no, that's yeah. Kind of yeah. 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 On the web, no. Oh, on the so web, yeah. There's plenty on the web. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot on the web. And now, so, so now, now the banks are also... The, <laughs> the thing is that, no, the reason I'm asking you is because, I mean, you said they're all over Oakland, actually. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, there's still physical banks in Isco mm -hmm. that are like real banks, you know, so there must be some... But banks have also moved into payday. As, so now banks do payday loans as well. So it's called bank payday. So they take it directly out of your account. I, you know, it's like there's no, you know, no need to manage a front window. Hello. Great talk. Um, there, it seems that there are some people to whom the scoring system really doesn't seem to matter. And it was actually Victor's comment about grades that got me to think about this. Like there are some, I can give C's and D's to students and tell them blue in the face and just don't see any 
care. Um, and it seems that they don't care because it doesn't matter uh, to them whether they get good grades. And likewise, it seems that you have a similar situation with credit scores where there are probably business leaders and senators who have very bad credit but seem to be doing just fine. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Whether the, that actually has an impact on life chances for everybody. On life chances? Um, well, I mean, it is true at the at the top of the scoring scale, you know, if you have a, you know, a, ha a certain kind of habitus, right, uh, relative to your credit behavior, uh, and you're very high, you know, in your credit score, um, it's going to be an afterthought. You won't, I mean, you won't m manage your credit score at all. You won't have any, there won't be any sort of reflexivity for that. And then there is a question of the people who actually don't need the credit system very much. I mean, I think that, um, the, and we see that in the, uh, and then there's the people who are totally outside the, the credit economy. Um, the people who are above the credit economy? So there's people who are above the credit economy. Uh, we don't have, well, in the, in the data, um, it's the paid off. You know, a lot of the, like the, the, the retiree, wealthy retirees, you know, uh, typically you have a lot of people who just don't borrow anymore. You know, they've paid off all of their debt, they've bought their beautiful house, and then, yeah, fine. Um, and then, as I said, you have the you know you have uh, the people who haven't yet built that that credit history and who don't care because of that reason. I'm not sure. I'm not really answering your question. Um, um, but you know the the f the fact is that um, you know somebody could be very virtuous with the management of their money and have a very poor credit score precisely because they don't use the credit economy very much. So it's, it's actually, uh, it's a very interesting question for me that, you know, you have to use the system in order to be virtuous at it. If you, and and, and um, uh, people are, if you will, m be made, you know, they're, they're made to use it more uh, by, by, the, by the way in which it functions. So that was the point I was bringing up when I talked about the third group if there are people, aside from the rich retirees yeah. Yeah. who don't enter, there are people who, for whom paying off, not having debt, is yeah. a virtue, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, but it's actually a vice, or yeah. not a vice, at least a, uh, yeah. a handicap in this particular yeah. situation, because the more credit you have, the more you can access, the more you can do with yeah. your things. And so it's an asset Yes, exactly. So the idea is that you know, if you have a very high credit, so then you can borrow at cheap prices, and then you can buy, uh, you know, assets and, and get more. Yeah. So that's the idea that you know yeah, it did. Right. Uh, yeah. And and we have a graduate student at Berkeley who's doing fantastic work on the uh, on the mortgage market and showing exactly that that indeed you have this virtuous circle at the top and then this vicious circle at the bottom. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.